We're, uh, we're in Ecclesiastes 5 this morning. We're in a very important subject of money. And I say it's a very important subject because although we have a huge range of financial circumstances represented on this campus, students who come from very modest backgrounds, ranging up to families with extreme wealth, the fact that you are on this campus learning the things that you are learning and in an environment of such comfort means that you are on a trajectory where in one way or another, money and how to deal with money is going to be a very significant issue for you spiritually. And, and uh, money comes with a lot of temptations and a lot of hard decisions. I want to illustrate that as we begin with a famous painting by the Renaissance artist Quentin Massis, The Money Lender and His Wife. It's a painting that confronts us with the choice that everyone must make between God and money. The money lender is sitting at home. He has a measuring scale and a pile of money in front of him on the table. He is carefully assessing the value of a single coin. And yet our eye is drawn to the woman sitting next to him, the moneylender's wife. She is leafing through a Bible or perhaps a book of spiritual exercises, presumably bought by her wealthy husband. She is having her devotions, except she is distracted by the money. And so so as she turns the page, her gaze is captivated by the coin in her husband's hand. And Massis captures here... uh, an ambiguity to make a serious point. His adopted city of Antwerp had become a world center for business and trade, and yet Massis saw that souls were hanging in the balance. Money might pull our souls away from the worship of God. Is this a tension you've experienced in your own life? We know that God demands our highest allegiance. Nothing is more precious than the message of his gospel, the forgiveness of our sins, the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus. And yet, how easily we are distracted. Some of us find it more exciting to go online shopping than we do to listen to what God says in his word, or at least sometimes we do. Well, the Solomon of Ecclesiastes is here to help us in this spiritual struggle by showing us the vanity of money. And he begins at the broadest level, not the personal level, but the societal level, speaking about the economic injustice that people suffer under the sinful structures of society. He's going to get plenty personal in a moment, but he starts by talking about the whole system. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. The preacher has seen something we all have seen, oppression and injustice. You see it in societies where the state seizes the control of the means of production, but you also see it in capitalism whenever profit is pursued without due regard for the well-being of other persons. And whatever the system, it always seems like the poor people get the worst end of the bargain. Ecclesiastes says, don't be surprised at that. He's not excusing unrighteousness. He's simply trying to be realistic about life in a fallen world. And he points out the hierarchical structure of many societies in which one person has power over another. Maybe the issue here is bureaucracy. You might call this the red tape interpretation. It's just the frustrations of this bureaucratic system that have a way of dragging people down. Or maybe the point here is that in many structures of society, each level of government takes something from the level below. And it's not surprising if the person with the most power abuses, abuses power, but that injustice eventually reaches all the way down to the lowest level, and maybe even the poor would oppress someone if they could, but they can't because they're at the bottom. The problem here is not bureaucracy, but tyranny. But either way, there is so much injustice in the world, we should never be surprised by sin. Even the very best governments, which 
assume from the outset that people are sinners and that therefore they need some kinds of controls to restrain unrighteousness, even those governments are far from perfect. And so we always see people buying their way to power, using position for personal gain, manipulating the system for their own advantage. Ecclesiastes is honest about all of that and talking at the broadest level. But like a good preacher, the preacher king of Ecclesiastes also brings this down to the personal level. This desire to get more money and more power is not just for people who are in public life. It's a temptation for all of us. And so the preacher here warns us this morning about the vanity of prosperity the vanity of prosperity. Here is a general comment in verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Well, here's a well-known truth stated as a proverb, and then the preacher adds his usual editorial comment about vanity. No matter how much money people have, people who live for money are never satisfied. You may know the famous comment of John D. Rockefeller, who was at the time the richest man in the world, one of the richest men ever. Someone asked him how much money was enough. He said, just a little bit more. Or if you want another example, Homer Simpson said to his boss, Mr. Burns, you're the richest man I know. Yes, Mr. Burns said, but I'd trade it all for more. The contemporary author, Jessie O'Neill, has diagnosed this as a spiritual problem. She calls it affluenza, which she defines as an unhealthy relationship with money or with the pursuit of wealth. Don't you think most Americans have at least a mild case of this deadly disease? And if you're not an American, but you're living in America, you might catch it. Even if we are truly thankful for what we have, we often think about things we don't have and perhaps how to get them. That that explains the sudden pang of discontent when we realize that we can't have something that we really want or explains the guilt that we feel because we went ahead and bought it anyway. Call it acquisition without satisfaction. The appetite that we have for what money can buy is never satisfied, and so the only way to curb that appetite is not to fuel it by more things, but being content with what God has already provided. Not craving more, but being happy with less because we are satisfied with Jesus. And it's not just money that poses that challenge to us. It's academic success, it's athletic victory, it's sexual pleasure, it's musical accomplishment, it's whatever we are investing in and looking for satisfaction from, always wanting a little bit more from all of those things rather than being satisfied with Jesus himself and what he is pleased to give us. That's a lifelong struggle for most of us. I can testify to it in my own life. I lived for maybe a decade in student impoverishment, but have been growing in wealth to a large degree ever since then. And those aren't temptations that you resist once and then are done with. They are lifelong. I think uh, just to give one example of it, compare these two lyrics from the Beatles. I don't care too much for money. Maybe there are times when we feel that way. But what about this song? Money don't get everything, it's true. What it don't get, I can't use. Now give me money, that's what I want. That's the, those are the lyrics of a divided heart. And Ecclesiastes warns us that living for the things that only money can buy is vanity. And so the preacher king wants to inoculate us against affluenza, and so he gives us several reasons why money and prosperity are vanity. These are all things, helpful reminders that help us deal with this lifelong temptation. Here's one problem with money. Other people will try to take it from us. There's a cynical view, but the preacher takes this view. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? 
He's referring to people that want a piece of the money that we have. They want to consume our possessions. It might be the government that wants to do the consuming, taking money away through higher taxes. It might be children, all those mouths to feed around the table. Maybe it's the freeloaders who come begging for us to give them something. But no matter who they are, the more we have, the more other people will try to get it, and we'll end up just looking at them taking what we have. That's what the the Ecclesiastes is describing for us. No one knew this better than King Solomon, I suppose, the richest man in the world, but thousands of mouths to feed in his court. There are elaborate descriptions of this in 1 Kings chapter 4. He almost needed to be wealthy to feed all of these people. The more we have, the more people will want it, and if we get it, we may not be able to enjoy it ourselves. This is vanity. Here's another problem with having more money. It will keep you up at night. Preacher King makes an interesting contrast in verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. It's a general principle here. People who work hard all day, and perhaps particularly people who work with their hands, are ready for a good night's sleep. But the idle rich cannot look forward to this luxury. They are up all night. In this case, insomnia caused by indigestion, perhaps the gluttonous diet of fatty foods that's given them a tummy ache. This is the medical description we have in Ecclesiastes. Having a lot of money can be unhealthy in a variety of ways. It certainly can be unhealthy spiritually. It may be unhealthy physically. If you have the privilege of working hard every day, whether or not you're getting a fat paycheck, count your blessings. The lifestyle of the rich and lazy tends not to be very restful. Derek Kidner looks at this verse and reflects on Western culture. He finds it ironic that we have all of these modern exercise machines and health clubs pouring out money and effort just to do the, undo the damage of money and ease. How ironic. Well, so far, the preacher has been talking about the vanity of having a lot of money, but what about the vanity of losing a lot of money? That's another risk that you run. Verse 13, another reason to be resistant of the temptation of wanting money. Here is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad, bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. There's a third reason why living for money is meaningless. It may be here today, but it will be gone tomorrow. And so Ecclesiastes gives us a case study. A man who tried to hoard all of his wealth, but lost it in some risky investment. Not the stock market in those days, but a ship that foundered at sea, perhaps, or a camel train attacked in the wilderness. Whatever the reason, this man took a gamble and suffered a reversal of fortune and ended up destitute, literally naked. Even worse, this man was a father, and now he had nothing to leave his son. The story assumes what the Bible teaches in other places that fathers and mothers have a duty to save and sacrifice so that they can leave a legacy for their sons and daughters. And now this man couldn't fulfill that fatherly duty. In the end, he lost everything he had. Verses 15 and 16, words that are echoed other places in Scripture. We hear them in Job. We hear them from Paul. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Here also is a grievous evil, just as he came, so shall he go, and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? You see, one day all of our labors will be lost. We've heard that a number of times in Ecclesiastes, and here it is made specific to the accumulation of wealth. It's a tragic reality every one of us has to face, that in the end we will leave it all behind. At the end of one of his most profitable years on the European tour, someone asked the English golfer Simon Dyson if there was anything he was afraid of. Death, he replied. I'm in a position now where I can pretty much do as I want. Dying wouldn't be good right now. 
Well, whether or not we make as much money as a professional golfer, the day will come when we leave it all behind. So what gain is there in living for money, in accumulating earthly possessions? Some people don't really think about that until they're on their deathbed, if then. But if we are wise like Solomon, we will think about it now. Martin Luther reflected on this reality of leaving everything behind and in his comments on Ecclesiastes shared this proclamation, as I shall forsake my riches when I die, so I must forsake them while I am living. Luther didn't want to wait until he died to wrestle with this question of wealth and possessions. He wanted to be ready for that day now by letting go of his possessions while he was still alive. That's something all of us can put into practice by being generous with the things that God has given us. What is it that we say to ourselves about the things that we own? Here is a wise way to look at things, saying to ourselves, now, here is something that God has given me to enjoy with thanksgiving for the time being, or maybe something he's given to me to give away for the work of his kingdom. But either way, I need to remember I won't be able to take it with me when I die. People who understand that they are headed for eternity and live in the light of that reality every day know how to travel light through this world. Well, there are many reasons not to live for money. They're summarized in a comment that, that the preacher makes in verse 17 about the wealthy person. Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness in much vexation and sickness and anger. There's an interesting insight into temptation and sin in the human soul. The miser will end up alone in his misery. This is where greed will lead, a man trapped in spiritual darkness, vexed with many anxieties. It takes a physical toll. He's in poor health and he's also angry. He's a bitter old man. Who has ever heard of a happy miser? Well, there is a better way to live, thank God. Ecclesiastes draws chapter five to a close with these words. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God." These are words for us. We are among those who have been given wealth, possessions, power to enjoy them. And here is our calling to receive this as a gift, to rejoice in the work that God has given us and recognize it as a gift of God. Now, some scholars come to these verses and they seem so completely contrary to the, what the preacher has just said that they wonder if he is speaking somewhat sarcastically. He doesn't really believe that life is very enjoyable, but he's trying to help us and enjoy it as much as we can, and so he tells us to eat, drink, and get busy with our work, for tomorrow we die. But that is not all the preacher says here, and I think it's important to look very carefully even at his wording, because I think he's giving us a balanced, God-centered view of everything in life. He's been honest about the vanity of prosperity, no one more honest than the preacher king who wrote Ecclesiastes, but he also wants to tell us the joy of finding satisfaction in the everyday things of life, working and feasting. It's a recurring theme through Ecclesiastes. It's not just this verse, it's in all of the enjoyment passages, as they're called. And I think the Solomon of Ecclesiastes knows that joy is real because he's experienced it for himself. Yes, our time on, on, time on earth is short, but whatever time we do have is a sacred gift. And so when the preacher calls it the gift of God, it's not sarcasm, it's godly gratitude. And he can say this because he believes in the God of joy. 
And I think it's very striking here that earlier when he was talking about the vanity of money, he hardly mentioned God at all. But here in verses 18 to 20 at the end, he mentions God repeatedly. It's maybe a good word for us in the depths of February, which is probably the most discouraging, depressing month on this campus. It was for me when I was a student. Maybe it is for you. It's worth asking ourselves if we're not finding the joy, is God at the center for me at this moment in my life experience? Because when he is at the center, there's a joy that comes from him even in hard circumstances. And these are very God-centered verses. Whatever joy the preacher is finding is a God-centered joy. Leave God out of it, life is meaningless. It's miserable, especially if you live for money. But notice the phrasing of verse 19. Yes, there are lots of reasons why money is vanity, and yet here he tells us explicitly that if we are wealthy, we should enjoy it. It almost seems like a contradiction, but notice where the power of enjoyment comes, comes from, it comes from God. Having things is a gift from God. Also enjoying things in the way they are meant to be enjoyed, that too is a gift from God. And when the God of joy is with us, even money can be a blessing for which we return the praise to Him. I think you have here a balanced view of earthly possessions. Here is a world created full of many rich gifts, but the power to enjoy those gifts does not lie in the gifts themselves. That's why it's always useless to worship the gifts instead of the giver. The ability to enjoy wealth or food or friendship or work or sex or athletics or music or any other good gift comes only from God. Think of it like this, satisfaction is always sold separately. And so the person who finds the greatest enjoyment in life is the one who knows God and has a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ that then brings joy to all of the other things in life. I love the words of the Puritan Charles Bridges who said, I have found more in Christ than I ever expected to want. I have found more in Christ than I ever expected to want. Leave Christ out of it. You have all of these desires, but find satisfaction in Christ. You find more fulfillment than you ever imagined. I love the way the English poet George Herbert Herbert wrote about the power of enjoyment in a poem called The Pulley. And Herbert described how when God first made human beings, he took his glass and poured out as much blessing as he could on humanity, riches, beauty, wisdom, honor, pleasure, all of these blessings, and the glass was almost empty. But then he decided to stop pouring. When almost all was out, Herbert wrote, God made a stay. Perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. In other words, the one gift that God had not yet granted was rest or satisfaction or enjoyment. And Herbert goes on to give this explanation. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me. So thank God that God has not allowed us to be satisfied in earthly things, but has left an element of dissatisfaction in every earthly experience so that we would be wealthy and yet weary, and in our weariness, our hearts would turn back to Him. I wonder, are you turning in this season of life from the weariness of earthly things to find your joy and satisfaction in Jesus Christ? Here's the the preacher's answer to the problem of of life's vanity. If you're not finding the joy, could it be that you're looking in the wrong place? Do you need to say, Lord, I, I am, I, you know how empty I feel right now. Help me to turn away from all the other things that I am trying to fill that empty space with and fill me with you and with your grace. Ecclesiastes is teaching us how to depend on God for joy rather than depending on one of God's many gifts. You learn this lesson well. And as the last words of this chapter say, you will not much remember the days of this life because God will keep you occupied with joy in your heart. 
You learn to enjoy God. You experience so much joy that life's brief vanity is all but forgotten. And I think the artist Quentin Macis understood this. I think he had learned this spiritual lesson. I'm not sure about it, but see what you think. Notice a striking detail from the moneylender and his wife, this masterpiece in which both husband and wife are tempted to turn away from God, to focus on money. And on the table between them, Macis cleverly and masterfully painted a small round mirror which is reflecting a scene taking place just outside the frame of the painting. There are dark lines of a window frame intersecting to make the form of a cross. I think it's hard to miss. And also in the background, the spire of a church. It's representing God and spiritual things. And there is a small figure reaching out for the frame as if to hold on to the cross. Could it even be Macis himself, I wonder? The artist, like the preacher king who wrote Ecclesiastes, is reminding us not to look for money to give us any satisfaction in life, but to reach out to the cross where Jesus gave his life for all of our greedy sins as well as all of the other sins. Hold on to the Savior and you will find full satisfaction in him. Will you please stand for a blessing this morning? And here is God's blessing for you, that you would know today the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ as you wait for the day when every holy joy will be fulfilled and every pure desire will be satisfied. Amen.